Good morning, and welcome to worship at Trinity Lutheran Church, and we're glad that you spent this time with us, and we pray that God will bless you as you hear His Word, as together we worship our, our Savior and King. So let's begin in a word of prayer. Dearest Jesus, we thank you that you are the crucified and risen one, that you are Lord of, li of our lives, you are King of kings, and you are Lord of the church. And so, Lord, prepare our hearts to hear what you would have us hear today, to take to heart that you would build us up in our faith and in our walk with you, in our relationships with other people. Lord, you know the burdens we carry. So, Lord, may you be our burden bearer again today. That in the place of those burdens, O oh Lord, you would give us strength, you would give us hope, you would give us peace, you would give us joy. Because you are our Savior. You are the source. And so, Lord, thank you for this time of worship. Bless us and guide us by your Spirit. For we ask this in your dear name, who with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are ever one God world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We pray, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. It says in 1 John 1, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, in word, in deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has sent his Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, Therefore, declare that your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, with joy, we celebrate the festival of our Lord's resurrection. Graciously help us to show the power of the resurrection in all that we say and do. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Acts chapter 5, verses 29 through 42. But Peter and the, and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than, me than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as a leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witness to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Theodos rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple, and from, the, from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ is Jesus. Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise all his angels. Praise all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created, and he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree, and it shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and mists, stormy, and wi stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his saints, for the people of Israel who are near him. Praise the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3-9 through 9, Born again to a living hope. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, whom, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inex inexpressible and filled with glory 
obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The Holy Gospel appointed for this Sunday is taken from John, the 20th chapter, beginning at verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked were where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. It is the first Sunday after Easter, and we hope you had a great Easter. And you heard us say, He is risen, and you can respond. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. One of the things my three boys like to do is do Easter egg hunts on Easter. And I hope you got a chance to do that. Now, my oldest is almost 12, and then I have a, a younger boy who's nine and one who's not quite five yet. So nine and five were the youngest two. And my oldest one said, Dad, can I help you hide Easter eggs? And maybe somebody in your family hid some for you. So we hid some high. We hid many low. We hid some that we knew that Levi, my middle boy, would be challenged to find and some that would be very obvious for little Ezra. So when they were given the green light to go and look for eggs. You should have seen the excitement. They ran with all the speed they had, and they had their bag, and they started finding eggs. But there was a point where Ezra couldn't find the easy ones. Sometimes they'd be right underneath his nose, and he would miss them, and and Levi would swoop in and grab them. And you could hear Ezra whine. He missed it. There was a treasure planted there for him, and he missed it. You know what that's like. When you have to miss out on a play date because plans change or somebody's sick, you miss out on some of the things you look forward to, and it's hard, and it's sad. That's what happens in our gospel reading today. Jesus comes and meets with his disciples. It's Easter evening, and he shows them his hands. He shows them his feet, and and he, he shows that he is risen from the dead. And there's joy, and there's gladness, and the apostles are excited, all except one, and his name is Thomas. He missed it. Jesus had a treasure to share, 
and he missed it. For eight days when they're all excited over seeing Jesus, he, he's in the dumps. His faith is shaken. His hope is gone. It's a terrible, a terrible kind of week to have. But Jesus comes and he talks to Thomas and he shows him his hands and he shows him his side and he said, stop unbelieving and believe. And Thomas is so full of joy, he can't contain himself. He said, Jesus, you are my Lord and you are my God. And boys and girls, that's what we can say. Because Jesus died and rose for us. He's our Lord. He's our God. And we can trust in Him. And that is the best treasure of all. Even when we miss other things, the little things, Jesus reminds us that the most important thing He has accomplished for us, and He'll provide for us. And so we talk to the older brother, and we coach little Ezra where to find those special eggs we had for him. May God so guide us to his blessings in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you have loved us, that you have shown us that great love by your death and resurrection. So Lord, bless us this week that we may be filled with Easter joy, that we might be able to express love for the people in our family and for even those that we don't get to see. Maybe we can talk to on the phone. So thank you, Lord, for the things you give us for the, each day that we can rise and sing your praise. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.
Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The theme for this morning is Thomas and me, and it's taken from the gospel reading from John the 20th chapter, beginning at verse 19. In Jesus' name. I want you to think about life. You know, we love the climaxes in life. We, we love the climax to a trip, that high point, that pinnacle. We love the climax to our career, those mountaintop experiences. Sometimes the climax isn't quite what we expected, though. For the graduates of 2020, this year won't finish like a climax. Dances and concerts and graduation ceremonies, many are canceled. My cousin's daughter, Katie, is to be married early in May, and, and so it's going to become an intimate, private occasion. It wasn't planned that way. But the crowds can't travel. They can't gather or experience in person the wedding that had been planned. They'll have to miss it. And that's hard. I want you to watch closely this morning because many commentators believe that this section of John's gospel is probably the climax, the pinnacle, the whole point of what this gospel of John is about. But it's not what we might expect. Thomas misses out on Jesus' big reveal of himself as the resurrected Lord, and he gets the title, Doubting Thomas. I'm not sure it's fair, but that's often what we think. So what does he miss? On that Easter evening when the disciples are, are together, they're hiding behind closed doors. It says because they are afraid of the Jews. And Jesus appears standing in their midst. He comforts them. He commissions them. He sends them out. He breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he empowers them to forgive sins in his name. Thomas wasn't there. He missed out. And now Thomas is struggling. He's struggling with unbelieving. This section of John reveals two important things about Thomas and two important truths about Jesus that we need to take to heart. So this morning we're going to look at Thomas the Apostle and then Thomas the Believer and in the process ponder where we are with Jesus. So first, Thomas the Apostle. Remember the word apostle means the sent one. And Jesus had many followers, but he had few apostles. These were hand-picked people that Jesus had chosen for a special role. They followed him for three years. We see it here, that special role. You see, for Thomas to be a believer, he didn't need to see Jesus as the risen Lord. He already knew a lot about Jesus. He could teach about him. And he could have trusted what the other apostles had said. But we see in Acts, the first chapter, when the apostles feel like they need to, to replace that open section that, that Judas had left, they, they were choosing only among those who had seen the resurrected Lord. It was a baseline requirement in order to be an apostle. So why is that important to us? You see, the role of an apostle wasn't just to teach what Jesus taught. It was to be a witness to what Jesus did, what actually happened in history. They were to be witnesses of this historical resurrection. And you see, in many churches today, the message you might hear is this, don't worry about the resurrection. The important thing is to think about the teaching of Jesus, how he taught people to love one another, to forgive one another, to be accepting of one another. But you see... If people say that that's what's important, the apostle would resoundly say, no way. That the heart of the gospel is that Jesus died and rose from the dead in your place. So you can trust him. And he changes everything. He does. Not just his teaching. You see, sin puts us in isolation. It separates us from the God who loves us. 
You see, he is holy and we aren't. And so we tend to run from him, to turn our backs on him, to think that we can live our life on our own and on our own terms. If there is one thing that this pandemic has brought to light is that we are not invincible, that we all have to face our own mortality. We're going to die one day. And so the things that we tend to trust in, our health, our wealth, our careers, our connections, they can be brought to a screeching halt. And so when relationships fail, when we are afraid, when we feel alone or cast off or counted out or corrupted by the sin that enslaves us, we need more than moral teachings. We need more than encouragement to do a better job. We need a savior. We need a substitute. We need the only one who could live a perfect life on our behalf. We need a God to come down to us because we could never work our way to him. And you see, our hearts are a lot like the room where the disciples were. Our hearts are locked up and we're afraid to let go of control, to let go of our selfishness, to let go of our greed or our pet sins. We're afraid to trust and to let Jesus come in or until he comes in. And as he does, and he does by his word and he does by his spirit, he comes and he says, peace be with you. And he shows us his hands, those nail-pierced hands, and he shows us his side. Because you see, he shows us through his word so that we can believe, that we can trust him in our lives into those nail-pierced hands. So friends in Christ, as an apostle, Thomas needed to see Jesus so that we can know for certain that the apostles, what they shared with us, they saw for themselves, and we can put our trust in their word as God inspired them to write it. Because Jesus has risen from the dead, our past has changed, for all our sins are forgiven, and we're set free, and our presence, our present life is changed because we know we're not alone, that the risen Christ lives with us and is in us and is for us. And because he has risen, our future is changed. We have an eternal home and eternal life with Jesus in heaven. Tim Keller writes this. He says, this is the reason why the poor and the broken and the outcasts in Roman society could get a hold of the resurrection. This is uh, what they said. If that's true, I have a new identity. I have a new dignity. I have a new hope. I have a new future. I, I have experienced liberation and I am a different person in Jesus You see, I believe John chooses this as the climax for the gospel to show us the transforming power of the gospel message, of the good news of Jesus' sacrificial death and his glorious resurrection on our behalf. So what does that mean for us as we look at Thomas, the believer? It's eight days later when the text picks up. The disciples are together again, and Thomas is with them this time, and Jesus comes into their midst. Again, he says, peace be with you. And then he focuses in on Thomas in such a way that the light bulb goes off in his mind. And he goes back and addresses the very things that Thomas said he needed to have in order to believe. What does that tell us? Jesus was there the whole time when Thomas was speaking. He just didn't make it known. Not yet. This is what Jesus said to Thomas. Reach your finger here and put it in my hands. And reach your hand here and put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered, and he said to him, My Lord and my God. 
Thomas' statement of faith is absolutely incredible. My Lord and my God, there's no greater profession of faith or belief anywhere. And look at what comes next in the text. In verse 30, John states this, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that by believing, you may have life in his name. John doesn't record everything Jesus said and did, and he's very selective. Scholars have calculated over the, the time that, that John chronicles for us, it may span 21 or 22 days of Jesus' ministry. So it's very intentional. Everything there is for the purpose of helping people believe that Jesus is their Lord and their God. So Thomas got to the pinnacle of believing. How do we get there? You do realize that for those eight days, Thomas was in a position that we all are. Thomas hadn't gotten to see, and we haven't gotten to see the risen Lord either. And Thomas' unbelief was born out of his refusal to listen to what the apostles had shared. Imagine what that week was like. They're full of joy. He's stuck in sorrow. Their hope is strong. His has been crushed. The apostles were eyewitnesses for a reason. They were given the Holy Spirit for a purpose, to witness to Jesus' death and his resurrection. And so Jesus says to Thomas, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Friends in Christ, we can believe because the witnesses shared what they saw, what God revealed to them for all the church of all time, for every person to know that this good news is for them. Believing in Jesus' death and resurrection, we are joined with him. By believing we have life with Jesus, eternal life, Real life, better than we've ever dreamed. So where are you today? Not where are you sitting, but where are you in your relationship with Jesus? Make no mistake, God is speaking to your heart today. The mes message of the gospel is for you. And too often it's our guilt and our shame that tells us that we are unworthy, that we're not ready to follow Jesus. Our pride tells us that we don't need him. And so the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 4, verse 25, Jesus was delivered up for our offenses. He was raised for our justification. So what does that mean? We try to overcome our guilt and our shame ourselves. We think that if we're good enough, we can make amends. We can justify ourselves, make ourselves right with God, but we can't. We need a perfect righteousness. Only God's Son was perfect. He was perfect for us. He was the perfect sacrifice. He's the perfect mediator between us and God the Father. But when he pleads our case, he shows the Father his hands and his side. He tells the Father, I died for them. The price is paid. They are free. Friends, that's the good news for you today. You're free. When God looks at you, he smiles. He looks at you with a love that he has for his son because you are in Christ if you believe in him as your savior. Thomas would tell you that if you think you can justify yourselves, you're kidding yourself. Instead, look at Jesus. He was wounded for you. As true God, he was wounded for you. 
The only way, the only way was for him to become man, to take on the crushing weight of our sins, the shame, the guilt, the separation he felt as the father turned his face away. Look at Jesus. He was wounded for you. And when you see that, when it hits home, it melts your heart. When you realize who Jesus is and all that he did and has gone through for you, no matter what you've done, no matter who you are, Jesus went to the cross for you. Because Jesus is that kind of Savior, you don't need to fear, not even death itself. Weeks after seeing Jesus, all of these disciples, they come out of hiding. They stand in the open and they preach Jesus, his death and his resurrection. Hearts are moved. People believe. Some still reject Jesus. They want to silence those disciples. But the gospel has to be shared and they won't be silenced. There is a boldness. The love of Christ compels them. They want everyone to know Jesus as their Savior. And friends, so do we. As this church, as the body of Christ, we want you to know Jesus. So as we struggle with these challenges of COVID-19, I'd invite you to turn to Jesus. Read through the Gospel of John. If you have time on your hands, it, God will speak to your heart. Ponder these words from John 20. What Thomas experiences and apply them to your life. Jesus is calling out to you. May you hear and understand and believe. In Jesus' name, amen. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus and a life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you that you are calling out to us through your word, through the words that you gave these apostles to write, through the witness that they bear, O oh God. May it sink deep in our hearts. And Lord, just like you knew what Thomas struggled with, you were in his midst even when he didn't realize it. And so Lord, you know what's going on in our lives. You hear our idle words. You hear the pain of our hearts. You hear the struggles. You know the frustrations or the fears. So speak to us where we are. And Lord, lead us. Lead us to understand that you are there and you have a good plan. And so we can trust you in faith. We can follow after you. So Lord, be the Lord of our lives. Renew our minds and guide our steps and work in us a faith that trusts you alone. For we pray this, dear Jesus, in your mighty name. Amen. We've come to that point in the service where we normally would take our offering. And so we're going to take a moment. We're going to reflect on a song, Give Me Jesus. Uh, Jess Frost is the singer and I want you to ponder the words, and then as we give back to the Lord from the gifts that He's given us, we'd invite you to do that. You, you can't do it physically in the church today, but if you have an offering that you'd like to give to the Lord, you can mail it into the church. You can also direct deposit. Um, we'd invite you to do any of those things. So it's a time to receive our offering and ponder these words.
Now confess our Christian faith and the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. And on the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that before time began, you knew each one of us by name. You knew how we would sin. You knew that we needed a Savior. And so you promised one already to Adam and Eve. And Lord, in the fullness of time, you sent him, your only begotten Son. You sent him into this world. You sent him into our flesh. And Lord, you sent him all the way to the cross. And we thank you for that good news that because he died, because he was wounded for us, we can be made whole. We can made, be made fully alive. And so, Lord, may we live in that newness of life today. We know that we will still struggle. Yes, you, you didn't promise that we wouldn't face circumstances where we might suffer loss or suffer pain. But, Lord, we know that we never suffer alone, that you are with us, that you are for us and that you help us. So Lord, today we lift up those who, um, because of this virus, uh, life has been upended. We pray for those who have lost work, who've lost income, who've lost investments, whose businesses are really struggling. We pray, oh God, that you would provide, that you would calm our fears, that you would meet our needs. So Lord, in your mercy, 
Hear our prayer. We pray for our leaders, O Lord, that you would give them wisdom and guidance that they wouldn't spend time pointing the finger or casting the blame. O Lord, that we would learn from this time everything you want us to learn. Lord, that this would be a holy time for us as your church, that we can not only um, express our faith, but live in the confidence of faith, faith in Christ, our Savior. And Lord, that we can express love to those who are in need, to those that need a phone call, for, to those that are in um, harm's way, that are serving long hours, caring for patients. We pray for those in the medical profession, for those first responders, the firemen and the policemen that, that interact with the public um, each and every day. We pray for the store clerks for the gas attendants, for all those that are out there. And Lord, we pray you would protect and guide. We ask, O oh God, that you would heal. That you would help um, medicine uh, for the breakthroughs that um, would help bring this virus and its great impact to a close. Lord, we thank you that you are with us, that you are mighty to save. So Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. And Lord, we pray for the churches of our country and, and your church around the world that we may faithfully proclaim the gospel and what the gospel truly is, that you died for us and rose again. You lived that perfect life, the life we could not live. And so there is real hope and a living Savior and Lord, we pray that this good news would go out through all this nation. That it would not only tune in to people's um, iPads or, or clouds, O oh Lord, but it would tune in to their hearts. That you would do a mighty work as you did in your early church. That good news of your resurrection would spread like wildfire and people would have real hope and real joy and real life. So, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And so, Lord, we thank you that you do hear us. All other concerns we bring to you in the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We now join in our closing hymn, Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia.
Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Again, I want to thank you for tuning in today, and um, we would invite you to share this link uh, with other people as well. They might need the encouragement, and we just thank the Lord for an opportunity to serve and to bless you this morning. So may God bless you this week. If you have questions, if you have concerns, we invite you to contact us. I'd love to talk with you. I'd love to share more about this good news that God has for you. So we're here, and we'd love to help. God's peace and bless your week. Amen.